Hello everybody, this is Janneke from Wisdom from North. I'm now in beautiful Venice, on holiday actually, but I brought my camera just in case I would find, find somebody to interview, and I did. I'm standing now next to Kristin Flod. She's a Norwegian, half Italian actually, journalist and author, and has written many best-selling books in Norwegian, including uh, In the Footsteps of San Saint Francis. But what we're going to talk about today is of course Venice, because she has lived in Venice for almost 20 years now, and she knows a few things about Venice that might not be in the history books. And I'm thinking about the mystical side of Venice, the, the story behind the facade. Christine, thank you so much for wanting to do the second interview. We just talked about your Norwegian books, but now we're going to, going to talk about Venice. So thank you so much for taking time. Thank you. And I just love to talk about Venice. I feel so privileged to live here in this unique city and I'm passionate about the store, the history of this place, of the art, of the beauty and also of the hidden part, the invisible part of Venice. Yes, and I was thinking that we could start with the history of Venice because before I came here I didn't quite know when was it founded and from what I understand we don't know exactly when it was founded. It's true. Uh, they say that people started to move out here around 600, 700, um, uh, and, but we don't know exactly. Because what happened, uh, and now we have a boat coming. <laughs> That's Venice. The canal, yeah. You know, people have their own boat. They don't have cars here, of mm. course. There are no cars here. And so the families have boats and they move around even in the evening, now he's preparing his disco for the evening, you know, <laughs> so he's... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, let's get, go yeah. back to the history. So around six, 700? Yeah. They say, so what happened in Europe when the Roman Empire fell in the middle of 400? And then uh, the whole Europe uh, came into a kind of chaotic state. Mm -hmm. And uh, the order was not there anymore and living in the mainland here in the Veneto region was really dangerous because you had people coming and robbing and killing and everything so they were looking for places to hide actually from the attacks and they saw that in front of them not far away they had this enormous lagoon really huge lagoon that had food uh, fish uh, and birds because uh, the lagoon was connected with the sea through three openings towards the sea. And every six hours, every, every 12 hours came the, the tide, the tide came with fresh fish, of course. So, and uh, there were small islands in the laguna where they could see the enemy attacking, coming, through the water if they did very often they didn't so the water itself was um, a sort of protection hmm. so they moved from the mainland out here the thing we know is that uh, already 800 after Christ they were um, a real a naval nation Com of commerce and uh, naval activity because there are so many documents that already shows that in 800 they had um, established a contact with the Arab world. The most, uh, when they moved out here they started immediately to build boats of course because and they became so good in building boats um, so that they actually wanted to explore more of the Mediterranean Sea and where in the Mediterranean Sea uh, was there anything interesting happening? Of course, in the Arab countries, because they were very uh, evolved at that time. All the Middle East, North Africa, they had a great culture with very refined knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the Venetians started to trade with this uh, part of the Mediterranean Sea. And already before 1000, 
they had a close relationship to the Islamic Arab world. And because of their open-mindedness, and I have always been so fascinated about the Venetians' uh, basic curiosity. Mm. You know, they were a very small town, very small city. They organized. They were not so interested in, in taking land. They were interested in growth, knowledge, commerce, uh, relationships. And for instance, I'm fascinated about this thing that they actually managed to create a close relationship and a close respect to the Islamic world mm. then 1000 years ago and we cannot do it today. So they, they knew for instance that to build a good business, to build, uh, you need to build relationship. So to build relationship all thousand years ago they knew already that you build it on three things. You have to know their religion, you have to know their language, and you have to know their customs, their habits. So how could the Venetians learn these things? Yes, they had to move down there. Small delegation of Venetians moved down and set up small offices all over their Arab world. Hmm. And they started to pick up, they started to learn the language, to learn the habits, to learn the religion and hmm. build relationships. This is fascinating, you know? Yeah, because I read somewhere that they were the European uh, most significant uh, trading port. Absolutely. They the became. most significant, yeah, and it yeah. has to be a reason. Absolutely. Hmm. And this was the fundament hmm. of what you say. They became this because they built relationship. Mm. And they also built relationships not only with Northern Africa and the Middle East, they were moving towards the East. As we know, the story of Marco Polo, mm. who lived in the 1300. Uh, he lived here. He lived, he was from Venice, and his father had already been in Kublai Khan's, uh, you know, uh, court or you know he, when he came back and picked up Marco Polo and took him back to China to 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 China and uh, so you know they built relationships they were magnificent to mm. do that and uh, this was because of the trade of mm. course but much much more as well and if you start to study the different details in how they did this Mm, it's it's amazing and I think that we today we have so many things to learn uh, mm. you know that we can actually relate mm. for instance uh, I'll take another example which I think is very nice in the system of La Serenissima this was a republic very early based on the same system as the Roman Republic which means that the gov government was elected but mm. only from high society, mm. okay? So, um, but, uh, so they had um, a public system mm -hmm. with juridical system, with all the practical public offices and so on, mm -hmm. to prevent the bureaucracy. Mm. Uh, they had an amazing rule. They said that all the public people having jobs in the public, they could have a job only for two years at a time. Then they renewed the contract and within those two years they had to finish all the all the paperwork to come to zero. The one that didn't finish to do there, they were out of it. They couldn't get renewed their job. And I always say why what about Italy today, which <laughs> has a bureaucracy that is completely crazy? <laughs> they should have a rule like that, and many other countries maybe also. So there are many mm. things in, in the Venetian, uh, you know, political system, and that mm. is fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. So they were um, uh, their own republic for a long time, but then Napoleon came, and they were under him, and then they became part of uh, Italy, I think, in the... 19th century or so? 1860. Okay. 
uh, when the Italian state was mm. founded, mm. 1860, 1870, then Venice became just, you know, a province, mm. uh, no, uh, um, um, yeah, a part mm. of, uh, of the nation mm. of Italy. But before that, uh, Venice had more than one, well, we say approximately 1,000 years of, of amazing history. Mm. And you cannot find so many places that has this so small, so compact, and with so much wealth, so many uh, amazing, uh, precious things mm. uh, through the Renaissance, for instance, because the Renaissance was a peak period also in Venice. You know, Italy, we always refer to Florence as the peak of the Renaissance. But that's why, because we don't know that Venice had its own Renaissance that was fabulous mm. with the Venetian painters. Milano had its own Renaissance. Without mm. Milano, Leonardo da Vinci would never have been mm. the one he is today mm. without the help from Milano, even if he was born mm. around Florence. Mm. Venice has its own tradition, mm. re a Renaissance tradition. Uh, you know, all the churches here are like museums of Renaissance art. But when, as you say, when Napoleon came, Venice was sort of full of itself because mm. it had, the city had had a success for so many years. They had become full of themselves. I always say that to Norwegian people, watch out so we don't get so full of our own success. Mm. Because what happened with Venice was that they started to be so centered on themselves, so they missed the point of what was happening in Europe. And what was happening in Europe? Napoleon. Mm -hmm. Napoleon was actually changing the history of Europe, mm. the Euro European history. And they were sort of half asleep, and they were so arrogant and full of themselves and, and dec decadent and they were not aware. He, he sailed in with his whole, all his ships and Venice just capitulated in two weeks. And what was amazing was that uh, he just, he came to this enormous treasure box with so many precious things. I mean, not only jewels and, and art and everything, but things that Venetians had bought and stolen for 1,000 years. And he did like this. He emptied the whole tre treasure box of Venetian art into his ships and sailed them back to Paris and opened, I don't know how many museums with Venetian art. And when I meet French people here in Venice, I ask them, do you know your own museum? How? many pieces of art in your own museum comes from Venice, they don't know because, of course, mm. the French school uh, do not, does not teach these kind of things. But mm. these are the parts of Venice that I, I love to mm. tell and that I, I do tell when families or groups come here and ask me to, to walk a little bit around and tell them how it is to be an author in contact with this uh, yeah, well, yeah. Because you you're a touring guide. You do tours I'm for not, families. I'm not really a guide. I'm okay. more. Um, I'm I'm a journalist. I'm a curious citizen, and uh, I I just people ask me, can't you show us people that know me or contact me? And they just uh, ask me if I can show them my Venice because I don't have the dates. I'm not. Uh, a guide in that I, I don't remember the on dates. paper See, on paper <laughs> I don't remember the dates exactly I don't have the history right on but you guided even Neil Donald Walsh around well these, that was uh, a, yeah that yeah. was a personal that mm. was a personal meeting mm. so it's it was not a formality but I remember when he when when we went through the Canal Grande the first time in the boat he came in and he was just like he was overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed by by the beauty, by the history, by mm. all of it. 
And you became friends, and he even uh, wrote the preface for your book. Yes, uh, Amur Fati. After, after those three days here in Venice together, we created a friendship, and uh, he came back to give workshops in this area mm. year after year. Now he hasn't been here for maybe two, three years or four years, but mm. for many years he came back and stayed in our house mm. and with us. So I, you know, mm. I got to know him better, and that was a yeah great gift. So let's talk about the mystical Venice. Uh, I love mysteries and um, I just, it was funny because I just emailed you and I s asked you, is there a mystical Venice? Is there anything like you know about, you know, secrets behind the facade? And apparently there is. And I think we, um, we have to talk about symbols because apparently Venice is a symbol. To me, absolutely. A great symbol. Because uh, like Canal Grande, for instance, that is, that's the main road, you know. And along Canal Grande, you have the most beautiful palazzi in the whole city. And during the, the glorious years, they were all decorated and painted in, in strong colors with mosaics and gold. And, you know, now we see them like this. But on Canal Grande, there were really great facades. But that's only the facade. So if you move a little bit in the back, there's another story. So the image was incredibly important and all about image was really important here. Uh, so, but what is behind the image is interesting because it's, it's more hidden. So this was the next level when I got to know Venice more. I got to know the facade, the, the normal story of Venice. I started to be curious, but what about that other story? that is more hidden inside the palazzi or behind those glorious, you know, uh, masks mm. and, and the Carnevale, you know, the Carnevale, uh, Venetian Carnevale is also a symbol of this because the masks, Venetian masks are world famous. The Carnival is world famous. Yeah, where did that come from, that idea of all the masks? Well, that's, that's the old uh, religious celebration of the Carnival. So it has religious roots. But in Venice, they created the Venetian Carnival as an as a enormous party where wearing masks, they were able to behave in ways that they longed to behave but couldn't do the rest of and then they had different kind of uh, uh, systems and different different kind of activities around the carnival different kind of parties and celebrations but it all comes from from the the big really sort of uh, explosion you know before you go into fasting you know, that's the, l the last explosion because you're before you go into the rigid fasting uh, before Easter. So, and this became like a European, uh, it became famous in, in all Europe what happened, especially in the 1700 here in Venice, at the peak where, where they became completely decadent and just doing parties and, uh, you know, mm. after the 16 and during the 1600 and the 1700. Mm. So, uh, and they were very free, sexually free, um, mentally free, open-minded, open-minded, mm. open-minded. So they had a lot of mental flexibility and openness and all through their history they they had this special relationship with the church mm. more, more spiritual in a way no not more spiritual but uh, they were not so the church was not so dominant okay. uh, as uh, in other cities because of their status economical status they could do things they could um, uh, not do things but they could how do you say see through the fingers you know uh, mm. uh, and not be so hard on for instance 
uh, knowledge or information or activities uh, that were against the church, like the esoteric tradition, for instance, had very strong roots here. Yes. So, yeah. uh, what is that all about? Yeah. Uh, f well, you see, there was actually a, an amazing activity going on first in in uh, Florence mm -hmm. uh, of uh, of this um, knowledge that Lorenzo de Medici took from Greece and from the Egyptian Middle East tradition to Florence because the Renaissance is actually the name of the Renaissance, the rebirth of something old. No, that's the principle of the Renaissance is giving birth to something again, mm -hmm. something old. So um, there was in uh, Florence a school called L'Accademia di Firenze mm -hmm. uh, with a very special author called Marcello Ficino who became uh, like a symbol of bringing the hidden esoteric knowledge uh, through the Accademia di Firenze into the arts. When, uh, when, when, the, at the end of 1400, when, when the Medici family had problems and it changed, the political situation changed, this movement of the es esoteric knowledge started really to flourish here in Venice. It was also, it existed before, but at the same time, there were also a lot of Jewish population coming into Venice. Uh, and there's a whole area here in Venice called the ghetto. That's the first ghetto in Europe, in Venice. And in this tradition of blending the, the mystical, the openness of the city towards the esoteric and mystical traditions and the Jewish tradition coming in with Kabbalah, with the Jewish mysticism, blending with this open, more esoteric part, mystical part of Christian tradition, this became like a big melting pot also for this other knowledge that the church was not so happy about, but that started to, you know, flourish and develop under the facade. That's why they had so many alchemists working here. That's why uh, you can find signs all over the city. Of, oh, really? Of, 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 you know, of this secret part of Venice. When you start to dive into that, you, you will find there's a whole uh, bunch of information about uh, magic Venice. And it's about how energies work, right? This no. esotericism? Yes, uh, the esoteric tradition uh, is, uh, is the hidden spirituality. Uh, that is also linked to what we today call uh, knowing how energy mm. works, knowing what is the actually four elements of the earth. How can we use those four elements, you know, the air, the fire, the earth and the water? In the Renaissance period, they had an enormous knowledge about this. Mm. They knew they had this relationship to nature. It's just fascinating. They, they had an amazing relationship to geometry, what is called sacred geometry, numbers, mathematics. They knew, for instance, the church where we were, you know, before, Santa Maria della Salute, mm -hmm. is created uh, based on, on the, uh, they say, on the, the Kabbalistic system that also has sacred geometry and the power of numbers in it. And that does something to you, right? When you use well, sacred geometry, exactly. that make, does something to the energy? Exactly, it works on the energy, you see? That's the same knowledge as with the four elements. We, we've lost this knowledge today, but here you have signs of it everywhere. If you want to open that box it's like a pandora box you just open and open and open and you find not only uh you know um, remains and signs from the old templar knight orders from the middle ages uh, they for instance they had a strong connection to venice uh, 
And somebody says, uh, say also that when they were starting to, to, to kill the Templar, you know, they kill, killed all the Templar knights, uh, this famous treasure of the Templars, somebody say it's hidden on one of the islands in the Laguna. The Holy Grail? Well, we don't know what it is, so what's the Holy Grail? Right. So we, we don't know, so... Yeah. It's here. <laughs> Might be. <laughs> you said, yeah. So these churches, they were built at the same time because all of them are very uh, similar to me. They look very similar. And they were they built uh, on the same principles then? Uh, no, no. Uh, not all of them. And it depends a little bit. But... Uh, for instance, Santa Maria de la Salute that I mentioned, they found out that the architect, Longena, in the 1600, he was probably connected to the Rosicrucian uh, esoteric tradition, to the masonry, uh, maybe. Uh, and uh, for some, maybe also had some Jewish blood in his veins. We don't know exactly. But there are signs of you know there are signs of this but not in all churches because you have churches here most of all the houses here are, is, are from 1400 and up because before that there were all wooden houses mm -hmm. there's only one wooden house left in this whole city and it's just uh, around the corner here to the right hand side it's an old um, uh, boat yard for gondolas and that's the only wooden house that is left. Mm. So all what we see around us now is from the 1400 and up. So the churches also, they are mostly from 14, 15, 16 and 17 and up. So different periods, different architectural periods. Mm. So, and many of them are, are, are you know, uh, normal churches without any mm. secrets hidden but there's for instance one other church that is really mysterious it's called uh, um, uh, La Chiesa di, San, uh, di, uh, Chiesa di Maddalena which is uh, Mad Magdalena church mm -hmm. and there are many many symbols uh, also what the kind? Sim like, like the one you see on the American dollar oh the, the eye, the eye. The triangular eye, mm -hmm. which is actually um, uh, a triangle and an eye in the middle, mm -hmm. and it's the symbol of the uh, Trinity, it's this, and God's eye that sees everything. Mm -hmm. But there are also other interpretations mm -hmm. about this, and there's a circle around, which is another symbol of unity, and so you can, you know, if you start unpacking, you can just unwrap it and find many different interpretations. And also the painters, they had hidden symbols, didn't they, Absolutely. in the paintings? Mm. And this was, in Renaissance art, it was really very, very important. You can imagine that in the, during the Renaissance, when the painting really flourished, um, people couldn't read, mm. normal population. They were not able to read. And uh, who bought uh, paintings? Yes, the rich families to decorate their beautiful palazzi. And the church. The church was interested in one thing. Educate. Educate in religion. So uh, the, the paintings, they were kind of books to communicate something to the population. You see, the population came into the church and they saw these wonderful paintings and got to know the whole story of the Bible, of, of the Old Testament, the New Testament, through the language of the art. Mm. But also through the symbols, because they had the knowledge in the Renaissance. The sacred knowledge. The of the power of the symbols. We, we have lost that. In, in, you know, it's, it's not a knowledge that we know of. But I sense in connect, connecting to the art here that something comes through. I just sense, I perceive it. Mm. Something comes through the art. It's not just the beauty. It's, it's not about just the colors. There's some other things. So I always say to people, you just come and uh, learn to drink. 
the beauty. Learn to drink of the art, even if you don't understand it. Just, you know, just take it in. Nourish yourself. Nourish your unconscious, your mind, your soul. Because again, maybe something affects your energy through these paintings? Well, that's a question. Perhaps. I mean, if I'm a scientist, uh, I, I would like to see the proofs of that. But when you start to get more uh, sensitive to, to the subtle level of life, to the subtle level of the universe, you can perceive some things that comes to you. And for instance, I'm still amazed by, by the power of beauty. We don't know anything how what beauty really is why does beauty have this effect on us people mm. come to venice i meet many people who says i just feel so different in this city it's so beautiful it touches me in such a deep way and for artists have come here after napoleon you know in the 1800 and 1900 uh, mostly artists came because artists have this sensitivity yeah. they have it they perceive it so they came came here not only to paint the light not only to paint the beauty mm. because they felt something yeah i was astonished i didn't know it was that beautiful um i was a bit skeptical because sometimes people say so much about the city and you come there and you're like oh I'm a little bit disappointed but this time in Venice it was the other way around it was just so beautiful with all the canals and um, and the labyrinth and apparently that's you know a symbol in a way too yes it is absolutely and that's what also people say when they come here oh my god I, I get lost I'm afraid to get lost in the labyrinth because of all the small, you know, streets and alleys and in the dark. And mm. <clears throat> so they usually walk the, the, the normal tourist path and they don't walk out of that path. And I invite everybody to, you, you have to get lost in the labyrinth uh, because when you get lost, you always find something new. That's the recipe to find something new. And that's also a symbol. When you get lost in your inner labyrinth, that's when you really find something new and that you can grow and flourish in a new way. Mm. And so artists, as I say, uh, they know this. They have this attraction. They have this sensitivity. Mm. And I also i have seen now the latest couple of years where I had workshops, writing workshops here, for people that are interested in in this part of life and also in going inwards writing from soul place in themselves they perceive other things in venice when they work with the writing they work their way during this week of workshops connecting with the big authors that were inspired from goethe mm -hmm. to thomas mann to Hemingway mm. and we I tell the stories me and a colleague of mine from South Africa Merle Levine we teach together and we teach in English and also a little bit a mix of Norwegian and English but mostly in English mm. so uh, telling the story and you know showing people that you can actually connect from a different place mm. you start to see the city in a very fascinating way. And I have to mention another symbol, the water. Exactly, the water is a feminine symbol. Mm. And the Venezia, um, Venezia, the name of Venezia comes from Venus. Mm -hmm. Venus is the feminine star of all, you know. And uh, Venezia was also always called through the centuries La Serenissima. Uh, so she was always a she, it was always a she, a woman. Mm. And uh, maybe because of the water, I don't know, but the water is a feminine symbol and it's also, for, to me, it's about what is on the top of the water and what is below. The fundament of Venice is below, it's this amazing uh, engineering 
uh, work of trunks. Here comes two small females. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, the, this amazing trunks. Hundreds and thousands and hundreds and thousands of tree trunks that Venice they, is built on. Yeah, that Venice is built on. This is the fundament. So it's, it's, it's a mystery. Nobody understands today how this is possible, but it's man-made. It's, yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. I mean, it's a, a city uh, in the lagoon, Laguna, Lagoon. Yeah, in yeah. the middle of the water. I think that's a mystery itself. <laughs> How can we, because it's us, you know, it's the human being that actually has created a place like this, uh, of, of different reasons, mm. but anyway, to just have that power to create such a crazy project mm. like this, completely crazy in the middle of the water. And completely beautiful. And completely mm. beautiful, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kristin. Um, where can people reach you if they want to um, connect with you or maybe do uh, have a guided tour? Yeah, well, they ha can have an author's tour mm -hmm. with me and uh, they can connect with me on the internet on my just they can find me on Google. I'm just www Christine Flood F L W O D. It's connected to water as well. Mm. Uh, dot com. So, so when is the best time uh, to come here as a tourist? Well, I love the spring just after Easter because Easter is quite packed. But uh, after Easter, there's a, you know, in late April, beginning of May, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. everything, the tree starts to flourish. And by the way, one of the hidden secrets in Venice are all the gardens the secret gardens mm. and uh, there's a club that I have been active in it's called the secret the club of the secret garden in Venice mm. and I know I have a friend who's uh, um, the director of this club and she's also doing beautiful things showing these yeah uh, small treasures that mm. also exist behind the facade because you cannot see so many gardens from the streets but when you open the doors and peek in you discover the most incredible things mm. thank you so much i'm so glad i asked you about this in the email that we did this interview now i've learned so much thank you so much christian thank you Janneke, and good luck and have a wonderful time in this glorious place on earth thank you i will and thanks for watching guys and i really recommend taking a trip to venice if you have the possibility. Much light from beautiful Venice. Bye-bye. Okay.